Hello everyone, I am Pierre Vinck and this is my master research presentation called Duo Playing, Improvisation, Interpretation and Composition. Welcome and thank you all for coming today. With COVID hitting us already two years ago and meeting large ensembles being quite difficult at the time, meeting with two people was much more realistic. This is by doing that with some friends and housemates that I started to very much appreciate the qualities of such formation. The close connection you form one to one, the intricacies you can get into and how easy it is to quickly react to one another. This is why I decided to devote my master's research to this topic and experiment with several different formations to see how to best work in duo formations. I limited myself to a few different formations, saxophone and double bass, saxophone and guitar and double saxophone mainly because those are the duos in which I've had duo partners I felt very much comfortable playing with. Here are my research questions. First up's question, how to blend or keep interest or variety with two instruments? How to go beyond the simple roles of accompanying and accompanied? How does duo playing differ with melodic and harmonic instruments? And finally, my research question was how to keep a sense of variety, find blend and surpass the simple roles of lead and accompanist in jazz duo playing. For this reflection report, I first collected data by transcribing some of my favorite duos, uh, which I selected because they were the most interesting ones to my taste and fitted the partners I wanted to play in duo with. The next step was then to analyze them and try and interpret them with a partner. Within the frame of this research, I focused on a few aspects during analysis. First, the range of each instrument and how they relate to each other. Then their rhythmical combination, how the two instruments are rhythmically linked and how they fit into each other's rhythmical pattern. How they were in foreground or background in relation to the other voice, when does one voice a foreground, uh, when does the other one have foreground and when are they equally important? And a more organological analysis, how each instrument specific capabilities are used in the frame of duo playing. Meanwhile, I also experimented with a few partners on improvisation, trying different approaches when improvising and deciding on what felt best when listening back to the recordings that we made. And finally, I tried to write some duo pieces and tried playing them and analyzed again what worked and what did not work after listening back to the recordings that we made. Let's first have a look at duo improvisation. <laughs> chapter, I will focus on improvising in duo in general. For this, I had the great opportunity to share this experimentation with a dear saxophone and duo partner extraordinaire, Julia Warren, 
which you have just seen in the previous clip. I will now give a description of what we did and the results that concluded. Our first goal was to improve the blending. At the beginning, our sounds wouldn't blend very well and it was difficult to intonate correctly. When first researching blending, we came upon a few articles explaining how certain intervals create extra tones that enrich the sound. We focused on one in particular that can be found in the references. After this documentation, we experimented by trying to play these different intervals and we found some ways to enhance the sound of the duo by making use of those harmonics. It is indeed possible when two musicians hold notes in a certain interval in tune to have an extra note appear underneath, making the whole sound richer and making underlining some more harmonies possible. This is of course very interesting and is a principle that we've tried to use a lot during our experimentation. You can see on the screen a table where you can find certain intervals and the harmonic they produce. They are called Tartini tones. You will now hear a recording of me and Julia trying to create such a tone. We worked a lot on blending. Indeed, blending can be very challenging, but it's an important component of duo playing. Indeed, we could have very full sounds on our own, but the overall sound would be very thin. That's why we devised the following exercise to work on our blending. We came up with that exercise to try and experiment on the tartini tones and harmonics mentioned in the previous section. It contains three of the intervals that create extra tones, the major third, the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth. We also wanted to cover the whole range of the saxophone to work on the blending of all the notes. That is why we started on the major third and then went up to a fourth and then fifth and then the other saxophone would join back through the same intervals. While the first run was not a success, the subsequent one went better and better, and because they cover a lot of the intervals, it made us more secure and more aware of the intonation and blend of those intervals. We then transposed it in order to cover all the possible thirds, fourths and fifths of the range. We tried to do this exercise slowly and with paying special attention to each interval in order to make sure that they are played correctly, well blend and well intonated. As said earlier, we have done a lot of improvisation together and recorded them. And when listening back, we tried to figure out what worked well and what didn't, finding specific spots in our improvisation. And then we tried to expand on them, trying full improvisation with just one of those IDs. This led us to develop these as texture that could either be planned in advance into an improvisation or just recognized and further developed organically during an improvisation. Looking for these textures have been a very exciting process. I will now list a few textures that we found to be very successful because of how they achieve a good level of blend and let room for good interaction. But first, it's maybe interesting to know the differences in the balance between the two players from texture to texture. Some textures have both players on the same ground they may not have the same role, but they are both equally catching the listener's attention. But other, other textures have one player in the foreground and the other in the background, usually meaning that one player, the one in the foreground, has a more soloistic role, catching most of the listener's attention, while the other, in the background, has more of an accompaniment role. The first texture is long tones. It seems like a very basic texture, but there's an infinite ways to make it very interesting. This is when both players are holding long notes and changing their pitch slowly, traveling through different harmonies. A lot of our improvisation were actually starting like this, 
but we decided to expand on it more, embracing the stillness of it and the slow moving harmonies. This is also where we realize the importance of voice leading in this situation more than harmonies. We could each focus on our voice without worrying about key or harmony and go on from consonance to dissonance and back, reacting to each other's movement while keeping our voice as making sense. While playing and experimenting with this, we found that a nice alternative to this is to have one player taking the foreground while the other one holds long notes as described previously, thus creating a drone for the foreground player to improvise on. We used it both as long solo sections by one of the players or just sparse moments here and there. The next texture is conversation. This is where the two players converse with each other, exchanging and bouncing off each other's ID. Why we chose this approach and why we liked it uh, very much in our recordings, it's because of how it allowed our attention to be devoted to the material the other player was playing and then fully devote our attention to, to answering it. This showed very much in our recording where this was where we had the most interaction. While one way of doing this is by having one saxophone playing at a time, answering each other, an alternative that we really like include each player alternating between foreground and background with first one stating their ID, then the other one doing so while the first one takes a background role of, for example, long notes or other background motives. This way, both players are always playing, but the role of who is in the background and who is in the foreground switches as the piece goes along. This was the second step we took when we decided organically to just linger during the other player's part of the discussion. Other textures include uh, what we call the water texture, with each saxophone doing small notes and sprinkling the space, which we very much like in how it intertwined both saxophones into one image. And then finally, um, the rhythm texture, where we would each play rhythm, uh, triplets or uh, binary rhythm, and then slightly switch from one to the other together again binding the two saxophones together and then slightly going away one from the other then coming back examples of these can be found as appendages to my research i want again to thank julia warren for helping me so much in the, this part of the research the next part is about duo compositions in this section I want to talk about the experiences that I've had while first transcribing compositions for duos, following the steps that I mentioned in the methodology section, and the experience of playing and analyzing them, and then subsequently writing for different duo combinations and about the results that it gave and the lessons that I could draw from them. 
First, saxophone and double bass. For this instrumentation, I first put my attention on a duo from Ben Wendell's Seasons project as he did with bass player Matt Brewer titled Marsh, found in an appendix from this research. It is interesting to note from the start, however, that this has been written and played originally on bassoon and double bass. It is important as bassoon and saxophone have timbres that are slightly different, especially in the range where the bassoon has been written in the composition. For the theme, the bass has those rather high notes, marking the beats with some pickup at the end of the bar leading to the new chords. Interestingly, the melody is in the tenor range of the bassoon, making it overall within the octave just above the bass line. The resulting blend is surprisingly good, as one might think that when accompanying a low instrument like the bassoon, the bass would use a low register, but these intervals of six thirds and so on around middle C are very effective indeed to create this cohesive sound. Anecdotally, when we tried playing this song at first, we thought of playing the bass line uh, one octave down, as it is tricky to play on bass at the written range, but the result was much less effective than when we tried again at the written range. The two solos are quite typical of what you would expect, especially the bassoon solo in the tenor range, while the double bass provides a normal accompaniment. For the bass solo, the bassoon has the advantage of reaching quite low, the saxophone not so. I will come back later on our struggle with this specific element. I then experimented on writing a piece for a saxophone and double bass. It is of note that Peter Willems, the bass player I paired up with for this project, is doing a lot of vocal and bass projects, so we were able to incorporate the voice in a few parts of the piece as well. When writing this piece, I tried to use the lessons from the analysis I made. I tried to keep the bass, or at least the top notes of the bass line, and the saxophone around an octave apart. I also tried to have a certain groove or rhythmical pattern that would make sense and be played throughout the whole theme. After a few tries with the melody, we found that having the melody rhythmically attached to the bass's rhythm was actually the best way to play it. I think that there are, however, still a few spots where the melody is maybe a bit too far away above the bass line and it creates a bit too big of a separation between the bass and the saxophone, which is not really the desired effect. For the solos, we switched between solos over the theme and solos over the chords of the bridge. Finally, for the ending, we reduced the theme and doubled it with saxophone and voice with broken chords and a double bass so that the high notes of the chord are not too far away from the melody line. While the saxophone improvisation was quite easy to come up with, we struggled for a while on how to approach the bass improvisation. The saxophone doesn't reach quite low enough that it can provide a convincing bass accompaniment to the double bass as we discussed earlier. We decided against it and instead used the saxophone to help highlight the chord's color. Also for a whole section of the bass solo is actually singing as well, which helps even more the improvisation. As the double bass can go back to its usual role while the saxophone is filling in some of the chord's color. We also experimented on a song by American jazz pianist Jimmy Rollis called The Peacocks. The first theme is mainly sung with double bass and a few sporadic saxophone lines, so I want to focus on the way we approach the improvisation section. We decided in this case to try and have a more programmatic vision of the improvisational section, trying to retell the story told in the lyrics through our improvisation. The song being about peacocks, we wanted to have this bird element, but as explained in the lyrics, they are singing a sad and bitter warning. The lyrics also call to a strong feeling of melancholy and of what might have been. We decided that the bass would try and highlight this melancholic feeling, music back elements of the bass line of the theme, but through a different prism, being very driving and square, while the saxophone are these peacocks singing their song, being more free and lyrical. For the second theme, we chose to double the theme in the B section, between the voice and the saxophone playing for the top notes on the intonation of the notes, with the saxophone starting slightly flat and joining the voicing, standing each time lower and lower to highlight the tension of the lyrics. Finally, for the final A section, we use the intervals specified earlier between the voice and the saxophone in order to enhance the chords by trying to find those harmonics together. On reflecting on this particular duo setting, um, instruments, especially low instruments, can be very effectively blended when writing intervals under the octave in a tenor range, and trying to cover different frequency range with the two instruments can sometimes prove to be actually counterproductive. I wish I had the time to show you the two recordings we made of these songs, but unfortunately we don't. So you can find them in the appendix of my research. For the next section, I will focus on duo with saxophone and guitar. We now have our first harmonic instrument, the guitar. This is understandably an easier combination than the others, but there are still a few very interesting points to get from this analysis, especially the question of accompanying a guitar solo as a melodic instrument. 
I transcribed this time July from the same series by Ben Wendell, Seasons. This can also be found in the appendix. I want to note that like in uh, the double bass piece, it is played by bassoon and a tenor saxophone. With, while most conclusions will remain true for tenor saxophone, it is important to keep this in mind as the timbre of both instruments are still slightly different from each other. Let's first have a look at the range in which both instruments are playing. In the A section, the bassoon is playing a melody which starts on the middle C and slowly goes downwise, stepwise, following the harmony. Meanwhile, the guitar is playing those arpeggios that end together with the melody, serving both as a bass line, as a harmonic device, and as doubling the melody an octave higher. The B section is similar, except that the bassoon is now playing a more sustained melody, and the guitar is only playing arpeggios and not underlining the melody anymore. It is then interesting to know that even though it has the ability to play chords, the guitar is here used mostly by giving it only single note lines, although the sustain ability of those notes um, make it easier to underline the harmony. Let's now see how the bassoon is accompanying the guitar solo. It starts by only playing the bass note of each chord, still keeping the skeleton of the rhythm of the melody on the one and on the two end, only playing other notes to create fills to highlight the structure. Later on, it starts mimicking the guitar arpeggios from the head, following here and there the rhythmical patterns that the guitar is playing during his solo. Only to come back for the B section to only playing the bass note very strongly on the wine, with add adding a few approaches later on, creating a change of mood. When coming back to the A section, he comes back to what he was doing at the beginning of the guitar solo, that he is only playing the bass note of the one and two end. The theme is then recapitulated very similarly to the first theme regarding the A section. In the B section they are soloing together, trading between slightly elaborated arpeggios for the guitar and slightly embellished ba bass lines in the bassoon while the other instrument is soloing. I will now discuss the composition I wrote for guitar and bass clarinet. This is actually one of the first pieces I wrote for duo. It's called Sunbeam. The bass clarinet here is close in range to that of the bassoon, so I could draw more of the conclusion I drew from my analysis, especially regarding the solo section. The A section has a guitar pattern that includes both a bass line and a highlight of the chords, which is what a guitar would typically, typically do, and for the B section we went for strummed chords. For the bass clarinet solo, the guitar keeps its accompaniment patterns of the theme and I took advantage of the low register capacity of the instrument to first accompany the guitar solo with just a bass line, then adding some of the arpeggio elements of the theme's guitar accompaniment. Let's now focus on double saxophone. For this instrumentation, I have also used Ben Wendell's season project. It's time the duo he played with tenor saxophone player Joshua Redman, February. The transcription can also be found in the appendix of my research paper. This piece is written almost entirely homorhythmically, with quite a lot of unison lines. The way the song is composed takes completely into consideration that it's going to be played in duo, with the groove, the harmony and the melody being one and the same for the whole A section in a very clever combination. With the bass being always played strongly on the first beat, defining a very clear bass line and harmonic progression, with the colors of the chords being then played on the jumpy offbeat that follow. We first have this pedal note of G, with only the bass line moving, played in unison. But when it comes back later, the voices are not in unison anymore, with first the chords being better established on the first beat, mostly with consonant thirds, but with the following of beats being in less consonant interval, like major or minor seconds. There are then a few contrasting sections that are more lines and melody oriented. The first ones are completely in unison, and the second ones are unison until the very last note, which is harmonized in thirds. The third one is actually only played by one of the two saxophones, while the other keeps the groove and the harmony going. Finally, the last section has the lines again in unison, except on the first beat of every other bar, harmonizing first to highlight the harmony. It is also interesting to listen to how they handle the solo section. During most of it, while one of the two saxophones is soloing, the other is playing the group verbatim and not straying away from it, just like a drummer and bass player would do in a groove-oriented song. In both solos and in the ending, even though quite intense soloing and trading is going on, the groove is almost always present in one of the two voices. I then try to compose for this formation. Um, I call this piece New Moon for two saxophones.
which I had the pleasure to play with Henry Scappard. I think we can see the influence of the transcribed piece in the composition very clearly. First, the way the chords are outlined, and then the, how we try to have this underlying groove at all times, kept alive by at least one of the saxophones. However, I still wanted the melody to be played over the groove and not have the melodic groove of the transcription. So I tried to draw from the conclusions of the other transcriptions I made and my improvisation experiments about range, intervals and so on, to try to make the melody fit and blend with the underlying groove. The groove has this pattern of combining a bass line plus notes of the harmonic colors played as upbeats. The melody is usually written within an octave above it, usually a sixth above the top note of the groove, being there also to complement the harmony given by the groove. The whole thing is also around the middle C and the octave just above. The theme starts with first the groove alone, then a short fill in octaves before going to the melody. I decided to break up the groove for the B section and have only the root of the chords being played in one saxophone and the other playing descending arpeggios on the chords and then ending with a big arpeggio traded between the two saxophones. For the transition section I wanted to try and augment the sound a little bit and make it more full to then reach some climax before continuing on to the solo section. For this I had the two saxophones now play both homorhythmically and with parallel fifths sort of emulating power chords as it would be played on an electric guitar. For the solo section we tried a few different things, but in the end we decided to try and keep the rhythmical pattern of the groove going, but enlarging the harmonic rhythm. We came to this decision because the song demanded to go forward, and most of the other solutions we tried, like long notes, uh, like in the B section, or just having the bass line alone, felt a bit too awkward in the song. We have tried to make it too repetitive, and we varied a little bit the lines of the accompaniment while trying to stay true to the rhythm of the original accompaniment of the theme. We also tried to keep the solos compact, so we stayed on one section of the tune, only with a new harmonic progression to try and keep things fresh. Overall, I must say I'm not too happy about this particular composition. The A section in particular feels a bit too empty in my opinion. Looking back at it, I think the accompaniment of the theme is particularly weak. First of all, because of how it goes mostly in parallel fifths, not including the third in the accompaniment, and secondly, because the bass line itself doesn't stand out as much as it did in a song I transcribed, probably because of how the accompaniment is so cluttered together. We have seen through the different examples, different ways of blending between two instruments, especially with two saxophones, by way, for example, of exercise to be done together. Instruments, and especially low instruments, can be very effectively blended when playing uh, intervals under the octave in a tenor range. We also have seen different ways to avoid the basic rules of accompanying and accompanied and build something on equal grounds or switch the roles in a more natural, organic way through the use of different textures or moods. Finally, we saw different examples of duo partner instruments and how they differ. Although we have seen that harmonic instruments like the guitar are so very effectively used in a melodic way, it is much easier to underline a harmony with those kinds of instruments. However, the fact that the attention is maybe less focused on harmony with two melodic instruments creates an interesting way to focus more on voice leading and creating lines without an underlying harmony set in stone. We have also seen, however, how two melodic instruments can also effectively highlight harmonies. This has hopefully shown many aspects of duo playing and how it can be effectively done. However, there are a lot of other duo combinations possible with different details, especially when it goes, for example, with unpitched instruments. Through all the experimentations that have been done, we have seen many things with what resulted. The results mean that there are different ways of playing in duos, but there are a few fundamental things to keep in mind. Always having an ear for blending through exercise to know each other or keeping in mind intervals and ranges. Making sure that when applicable, of course, there is an underlying groove that is always present in the player's mind. All these results are very interesting for people who want to dive into these particular formations so they know what to look for, how they can improve their sound and overall be more effective. These are, however, results that worked well during my experimentation with specific duo partners and can, of course, vary from person to person and from situation, style or even location. There are indeed many other components to these type of settings with different other types of instruments. 
it can be also interesting in the future to extrapolate these as well for a trio or a quartet, maybe just not in a traditional sense. I want to thank everyone for coming to my presentation today. And of course, a big thank you to all my dear partners, Hans Song, uh, Anna Schapert, Peter Williams, and of course, Julia Warren, who should really be credited for half of my research. A big thank you to my main subject uh, teacher, Rainer Witzel, and of course, Jesse Passenier, my master coach. I will now step on stage and I will be available for any questions you have. Thank you. Welcome, we're here in the live room at Conservatorium Maastricht. You've just seen the video presentation of uh, the master research of uh, Pierre Vinck. And we will now invite him uh, to the stage for a Q&A. If you have questions of your own, we would encourage you to write the question in the chat uh, and we will be able to read them out here and ask them to our candidate. Pierre, welcome. So from here, I will ask also the first question. As 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 you mentioned, I have been your research coach through uh, throughout this um, research. Um, it's been very nice to see your presentation, uh, and um, one of the things you highlight are the also in your uh, documentation are the Tartini tones. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, wondering a few things about it. One is how did you learn about them, and second in this exercise that you've created, um, I was wondering when do they surface, how, do, how, how does that work? I mean, I don't think that every time you play a major third with, with saxophones, the Tartini tone appears. So I was wondering how that experimentation brought you into making, you know, finding that more, uh, more easily maybe, etc. cetera. Um, so for the first part regarding uh, Tartini tones, um, I mean, I think I don't know exactly where where I first we first heard about it, but we we knew that you know uh, with combinations of sounds in particular intervals, we knew that there was uh, harmonics works going on. We weren't exactly quite sure what was going on, so we just researched it a little bit, and then this was this this term, the Tartini tones, which kept coming up. Um, so we just looked at it, and we there's an article that I put into references that actually shows. Um, actually in detail which uh, combination of, of uh, like which intervals give which uh, extra tone um, and so we just experimented a little bit with that um, indeed it, it doesn't show every time because it needs also we, we actually uh, uh, realized because <laughs> Julia moved recently and uh, when, when we just recorded these, these samples for the research Somehow they 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 were very much more present present than when we than in the previous uh, room where we were uh, uh, experimenting. So that was that was also very interesting. Um, and how we came up with that exercise? Basically, at the beginning, we actually just wanted to experiment with those uh, tartini tones, indeed, to just uh, you know try to hear them, which uh, uh, in which range they would pop up more. Um, but actually, as we were doing it, it it sort of just uh, we really saw the uh, that it was more. It was the, the usefulness of it was more than just actually to try and find out the Tartini tones. It was actually uh, helping us tune, helping us uh, blend our sound. It was just like a very um, also just relaxing exercise to start our uh, sessions with um, and to just um, improve our overall sound. Great. Can, can I join in on this on the Tartini tones? Sure. Yeah, I found it also very interesting. I, I think you you really succeeded in general in, in uh, getting this blending sound, especially in the saxophones. When it comes to the Chartini tones, I've been wondering, I've been reading about it because I never heard about it before. But uh, for example, if you would play an A in a, in a, in a C sharp, um, the resulting Tartini tone, if you use the equal temperament that we're very much used to, right, you would actually get a resulting Tartini <coughs> tone, if I'm correct, um, that is a slightly a, a bit too sharp, right? But uh, if you play uh, those thirds um, um, in a natural temperament, um, then you can flatten that out in a way. Did you experience difficulties with that? 
Yes, indeed. So that there's, it just comes up with uh, with tuning, uh, indeed. And we, we just we just experimented a little bit, and I cannot say exactly when we were at equal temperament. When we were at, it was it's difficult to say. But I mean, it was just about uh, what sounded good in our mind, and how when when the this extra tone was uh, uh, actually helping the sound and not being disturbing in any way, you know. Um, I cannot say exactly what was our tuning when it sounded good, uh, but it's just about more the the mindset of just um, being aware of this uh, extra tone and just um, because actually at the beginning it's it's also just about um, looking for it uh, orally, you know. It's not uh, it's it, because it's 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 a little bit of a training to actually know oh that's what it is, you know. At the beginning it's like also searching where is it, you know. Um, yeah, I hope this answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's interesting because it also depends on uh, when you record it, if you play it back, because the Tartini tone actually just appears in your ear, right? So if you have the recording, um, you might not hear the Tartini tone because it's physically not there, right? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but I, my understanding is actually that it's, it's not so much... Uh, because anyway, the, the recording plays... Uh, those two tones, and so it's it's not so much that it's actually there. It's more the combination of the two two tones that. So that's why also it, I think it shows up. Actually, it didn't sound so well here, but I, th I still think you it pops a little bit it's because it's it's not something that uh, you know the recording device cannot um, record. It's just that the two uh, two wavelengths together um, create this 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 extra extra tone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would have some different questions because you really. Uh, yeah, I think we <laughs> <laughs> Not just about we Tartini. Can't, we, because we don't know it, but how about rhythmics? Because this is like really super interesting when, uh, when you have like a dual situation, there's no grammar, you kind of rely Indeed. on uh, yeah. grammar. So, um, um, yeah, I would be curious about your approach because you have to be. Playing like two saxophones or bass, uh, double bass saxophone, being very strong with phrasing, timing, right, and then mm -hmm. rhythmic figures. Yeah. So my question would be, how about rhythmics? How about grooves? You mentioned the grooves. Yeah. Um. How about your approach, like timing, micro timing, phrasing? Uh, what would be your appro approach in a certain groups, like two saxes or? Or bass sucks. What did we have else? Um, what else did we have? Guitar. Guitar. Yeah. Yeah. So approach and how did you use this in your own compositions? Like the grooves, some polyrhythmics, or did you experiment with this kind of stuff? Like rhythmic wise? Um, so uh, polyrhythms we did use with uh, our in improvisation with Julia. Mm -hmm. I, um, I didn't show any example here, but we definitely. Uh, Experimented with that um, for the uh, and also switching uh, rhythms for the uh, approach on groove for the uh, for the compositions of the other um, uh, duos. Um, I think uh, maybe I don't understand your question, but it's 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 it, it was it was just naturally something to focus on and to really make sure that we. Um, you know, we were agreeing on the on the groove, on the on the on the tempo, on the. It 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 was very. It was not really something. Um, I don't think it's something really particular to duos. I think this uh, groove feeling it's is just something general that uh, musicians have. So um, it was more just about actually agreeing on which which groove on on being together uh, on that groove, but just like you would do. Also with the big band, for, for example. You know, right. so Did you notice, for example, that you had to really like work on uh, this, this feeling phrasing together? Because this is what you mentioned. Everybody has, you know, like work out, you know, like timing, mm -hmm. phrasing, and everything. But did you face like some difficulties with like getting together or yes, practice yeah, yeah, definitely. Together, or you had some ideas to practice together. It's this kind of clicking together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Phrasing. Um, yes, I mean we 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 had difficulties, but again, it 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 didn't feel as like something that was uh, particularly more 
relevant to duo playing than than other types of ensembles. It was actually we we were doing uh, regarding that the same work that we would do. You know, um, if I was with the saxophone section, for example, you know, we would just we would just uh, uh, make sure that you know, oh, this this should be like this. It should be short. This should be it should be longer. This should be we should just accentuate this this beat. That sort of thing. It's like the sort of discussion that that's you know uh, felt natural. Uh, in a music uh, music ensemble, but um, I don't I don't feel like we've. I mean, the the only thing is that indeed we were much more. You know, it was more easy to. That, that's the good thing with you as well is that you know when we are a quartet or a quintet, it's, it's sometimes difficult to everybody has to agree or something, or then every, somebody has to take the final decision and maybe some. When we were just two people, it's much easier to actually uh, discuss and and to actually find a common ground. And the less people you are, the m you know, the, you can discuss more. You can you can then uh, go more in details and agree on something that maybe you don't have the time to do when you have or like the, when you have five or four or five people. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Thank you. I have maybe a question regarding to your question because I mentioned when you uh, showed the video uh, with Julia playing, it was like you communicated um, via via um, your body movements, could it be that this is the groove connection you had, the rhythmic um, connection? Um. <coughs> and how, how was it with the others? It yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely different with Julia than with the others, uh, because with the others we were, uh, so I, I came with, with um, Compositions that that we played, so there was already sort of like this established thing. With Julia, it was quite it's quite different. Um, I didn't f I didn't feel I don't know maybe Julia feels different, but I didn't feel like uh, uh, our body language was a big part of it. Um, also, because actually we, we when we, it, it, at least on my side, I, I don't know if she was closing her eyes, but there was a lot of times where when when we were when we were playing, we actually just. We were playing our uh, with uh, closed eyes. Um, I think I think actually for me it's much more uh, uh, listening than actually uh, uh, <coughs> seeing from my side. Uh, and actually, we, we with Julia, it's, it, we we actually uh, practice a lot these these rhythm things, and so and and it was not always very easy to sort of synchronize, and it's still not sometimes, you know. Uh, one of us comes up with a rhythm, and it's and it's it takes a little bit of time to actually catch that rhythm or something like that. But that's just something that happens and that we embrace in a way. Um, but uh, no, I don't think body language really actually takes part in in, in that. Yeah, you mentioned quite often uh, in your research. Um, that you're looking for a good blend, and yes. I was wondering if you can define for me what is a good blend. What is a good blend? It's, um, I mean, I think the simple definition is more like that, uh, where the sum is great, where the total is greater than the sum of its parts, or something like that. If you see what I mean, you know, uh, when when putting two sounds together actually augments them rather than than uh, reduce them. So following up on that. Uh -huh. How was the experimentation about that working? So how did you get from maybe a poor blend to a good blend? What was the kind of thing that you would do? And just the approach kind of. Um, actually, it's really really what, what, I, what, I, what I mentioned earlier. Just uh, We were just playing um, intervals, first even just, just one, the same note. Um, and then when playing the intervals, we actually kind of looked at it. I think maybe it's Rainer who mentioned something. I don't remember actually who mentioned it to us yeah, first. It was Rainer, right? Yeah, uh, about those extra tones. So we had a look through it, and then we, we looked at the intervals that were um, uh, relevant for, 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 those, uh, for those tones. And then we just tried and play them and, and looked actually for it. Um, we did the, the exercise that I noted to, to actually look through it. and. I don't know if it's actually the look, the, the actual fact that we um, found the tartany tones, or if it's just an overall thing that we, that in the process of looking for the those tones, the blend sort of um, uh, came with it, you know. Uh, 
but it's definitely this looking through it uh, and more uh, process of just playing intervals and actually listening to the result, resulting sound. Maybe it wasn't only the tartany tones, but um, I think that's what, what helped, definitely. Yeah. Okay, and then one more question about your um, process of transcribing and then towards starting compositions. I think it was mm -hmm. always in this order, yeah, if I'm yeah, correct, yeah. right? So um, once you had done your transcription, uh, you would, I think, uh, first also go into analysis and then into composition, yeah. if I'm correct. Yeah, so how, how would you, what would your starting point be before your composition got started, let's say, which kind of um, tools, let's say, would you usually sit with and like, okay, I, I kind of need to use that, or like, how, how is the translation happening, let's say? Because I think you were tra trying to translate, if I'm yeah, correct. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think it depends um, on maybe on the double the double saxophone. Yeah, is a good yeah, one because that, that, that's at. the one that, that definitely uh, has the most connections, and at the same time, not really, because I think I think <laughs> that's the one that I did. Yeah, you were poorly. also unhappy you mentioned, yeah, yeah. but it's may um, maybe also interesting. But but, to but look at. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so I just I just um, first try and identify in the in the transcription. Uh, so I focused mainly on the theme at the beginning. Um, I, I tried to really identify um, wh why why did it work? Uh, what was the 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 key to actually um, having within the composition being able to find that groove, that pulse? Uh, trying to especially you know in the ones with our, with a melodic instrument, how uh, how did we still hear the harmony? How how was the the chords outlined? Um, how was the melody out outlined? Um, and in, in that one, there was uh, definitely this heavy bass line through the bass notes of the saxophone really clearly on the downbeat. Um, I tried to work with that, but um, to have a bit more, uh, not really just a, uh, a chord per, per bar, but you know, changed up a little bit. I still tried to have this very low um, uh, bass note then. Uh, they, they were just playing with the offbeats. Um, they were they were outlining the the chords. It was it was a bit special in in which is really interesting in that um, uh, uh, in that composition is that actually it's 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 not clear exactly what is the melody, what is the you know when when which is what what function has its note as, as each note is it like bass note, a chord mm -hmm. note, a chord note is it the melody. Um, I decided if I if I was doing if I was if I was going to do that it would be too much like exactly the same <laughs> tune so I, I I chose to uh, mix it up a little bit with with actually just using one saxophone doing kind of what 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 they were doing um, uh, sort of like a as an accompaniment and then and then add a melody on top on the other saxophone. Um, but for that I used actually. Uh, so like the elements from the other, other especially from the uh, from the double bass one, I think uh, March was really interesting for me to see. Um, you know, as I, as I explained that, you know, you think, oh, the bassoon is kind of a low instrument. The the bass is going to play even lower, right? But actually, no. They actually sort of just just uh, just blend together very, you know, sort of like in this standard range around middle C. Um, and that's what I try to have as well um, uh, for the melody in in, uh, in New Moon in the double saxophone. Uh, that it's um, yeah in this in this range towards the accompaniment, not not too not too far apart. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, sorry, I, I maybe I strayed away from your question, but it's really was identifying um, the key element of what made it work. How how was the how were the harmonies outlined? How were the the, the groove outline and so on, and try to find take those elements and try to um, apply them not not too literally, otherwise you know I was just <laughs> making the same composition again. So try to um, switch them up a little bit and and try and try and see um, if it worked. It was it was very much more like of a etude process more than uh, yeah. Thank you. Any online questions happening? Not right now. Nope. Okay, nope. that's fine. We're going to wrap it up from here. Yeah. So, 
Thank you very much, Pierre, you. for your uh, for your answers. Thank you. Uh, we will now go into a recess, uh, into a deliberation process, and we will uh, return with the next presentation from Sebastian Schlapperflach at two thirty. So, thank you.
I'm Schlappe and I'd like to present my master research. How can effects, sound manipulation, looping and visual elements contribute to a strong double bass solo performance and what elements of the outcome can be integrated in free contexts and in possible collaborations? One of many great things I've learned in the last two years here in Maastricht is that the answer to why we do what we do is the most interesting part. So why did I choose looping and effects as a research topic? Technology has always been something which inspired and fascinated me. Since I started to make music, I was fond of effect pedals and music technology in general. Looping was one technique in particular. When I started my masters and thought about what to research, the COVID pandemic was in full swing. I knew it would be difficult to start a new band and bring them all to Maastricht. So I thought, what if I am the band alone? I had some experience with loopers and effects, but they were quite unsatisfying. So what if I developed a perfect looping machine and used my crush on pedals to make it sound more interesting? But I want to go a step further and combine this with visual projections, which are informed by my setup. My concept is that the visual projection is not programmed in advance, instead it is generated and reacts to my performance through algorithms within predefined parameters, and this way it would be possible to use existing gear in concert venues. Methodology I approached this research with an action-driven methodology. I designed my desired outcome and tried to find ways to realize them. I ran into various dead ends and began all over again. This is how I tackled the subtopics. Looping. Research what was and is there. What is missing? What do I want and what do I need in a looping machine? Start building one designed to my own needs. Subtopic 2. Sound manipulation. Explore different combinations of effects, natural sounds and extended playing techniques. Try different orders of pedals, record improvisations and reflect on the outcome. Improvisational context. Dismantle the complexity and transform into an intuitive handling. Improvise with the rig, different people and reflect which aspects can be improved over barriers are lying. Visuals. Research how to provide usable data and find somebody who can generate art with it. In hindsight, there were basically two stages alternating. Phase 1. Researching, implementing ideas, programming and testing. Phase 2. Making music with it, being creative and gathering ideas. Part 1. The quest for the perfect looper. First of all, there is no such thing as the perfect looper, but there is a perfect looper for me and a perfect looper for you, and they are most likely very different. But first, let me tell you about my history of looping. When I started my looping experiments in the early 2000s, I used simple stompbox loopers. They were fine when playing alone, but often I tried to use it in a band for looping a bass line and then playing sorts of guitar stuff on top of it. It was almost impossible to get it lining up to the rest of the band. And in 2003, I found a looper unit called Repeater from the company Electrix. This one had all the features I was longing for. Four independent tracks, an effect send and return and MIDI sync. In my graduation concert in 2004, I did my solo performance with this unit. Back then it was acclaimed as the best looper unit of all times. Actually, the story could end here, but here comes the sad part. Unfortunately, it broke after a short time. The company was out of business and the product discontinued. That was in 2005. When I started my master study in Maastricht, I rediscovered my interest in technology and looping. I wanted to explore the possibilities of 2020s in regards of live looping, and to develop a one-man show set up due to the COVID pandemic seemed logical to me as well. What attributes does my perfect looper have to have? Of course, looper units became much more sophisticated and developed over the last 15 years, but still, they all lack an important aspect for me. Flexible audio routing, multi-track output, effect send and return loops, not to speak of quantization and different loop lengths. I'm working with Ableton Live since 2003. There are so many aspects why Ableton could be the core of a perfect looping machine. It is designed 
to work with loops in a totally different way compared to other doors. It is extremely stable and designed for live performance. It has the ability to connect to remote hardware like launch pads to control all sorts of functionality. It can handle both MIDI and audio signals. It is capable of complex audio and MIDI routings and it has built-in effects optimized for live performance. And last but not least, with Max DSP integrated, you have got an incredible powerful platform for custom effects and tools of all kind. In a perfect looping machine, I want possibilities like different loop lengths, pitch shifting of individual loops, independent effects for each loop, quantization of recorded material. First steps with Bink Looper. At the beginning of my masters, I vaguely knew what I wanted to research. Something with live looping and effects, I said. Luckily, in this early stage, Matthias told me about Bink Beats. Frank Wink is a Dutch producer, multi-instrumentalist and composer living in Utrecht. He started a series called Beats Unraveled in 2013, where he reconstructs iconic beats. It became successful, but he did not want to build a career on beat covers and abandoned this concept. He took a year off and developed his own music. Although it is based on loops, he did not want to simply stack layers upon layers. He was longing for song structures that include stopping of loops and restarting them at a later point. But he ran into the problem that Ableton is not able to do that natively. He developed a Max for Life device which controls aspects of Ableton Live's track controls like arming, recording, stopping, playing and quantization of clips. And with this device he could implement complex song structures. Ableton published a video of him where he explains his setup and how it works. When I saw this video I was absolutely thrilled. This was exactly what I was looking for. With the Bing Clooper device, I developed a bass version of an old song, Mo Better Blues. It took about two weeks of work to get the script programming right, and still I had to record about 18 takes until I had a version which was okay. I often pressed the next scene button a bit too early or too late, which resulted in total chaos. Some scenes were 36 bars of recording long. Sometimes something went wrong and because all the parameters are well hidden deep down in envelope curves, it took sometimes hours to find the mistake. I had also problems with the CPU power, although I was not using many effects. Monitoring through Ableton Live was not reliable and the latency was bothering me as well. I thought it might not be the right approach because when I wanted to improvise with my setup it would become very complex very quickly. But this was something I really wanted. I wanted to explore sound manipulation. It wasn't suitable for my workflow neither. I wanted to record and loop in a more spontaneous way. I think Bing Cooper works so well for Frank because he uses mainly the natural sounds of many different instruments and effects only lightly. His tracks are perfectly planned, arranged and rehearsed in advance. Whereas in my case I have the same instrument all of the time and use external gear to manipulate my sound. I want to have access to looping parameters on the fly and be spontaneous. Big Looper was a great start and experiment, but I needed more control over Ableton in a customized way. Then I found CliffX Pro. Improvisation is a very important aspect of my musical identity. Being flexible, spontaneous and fast with my looping setup was a key ingredient. I need the operation to be low threshold and intuitive. Funny enough, it was this Bing Clooper tutorial of Conor Shafran where I found about CliffX Pro. He mentioned it in the comments. This software is so powerful and gives me everything I need to bend Ableton Live to my needs. It became the centerpiece of my setup and still has a steep learning curve. CliffX Pro was developed by Sam Stray Hurley and is a control surface script. It is not bound to one specific piece of hardware though. It can be controlled from different sources with little commands such as, for instance, Metro for turning on off the internal metronome or BPM to set the tempo of the project which you simply write in Eclipse name. You can control and access everything which is controllable via the Ableton Live API or LOM without diving into Python programming. 
it is possible to program any MIDI controller to do almost every command or action. Some of this is possible with the built-in mapping function of Ableton Live, but you would have to remap everything every time you start a new project. Furthermore, CliffX Pro, you can combine different pieces of hardware to interact. And best of all, you can even add a custom Python code to extend your needs of control. The quickest way to uh, explain what CliffX can do is by showing what it does in my set. So I have uh, a launch pad here, uh, which I customized. And I have those eight buttons represent eight loop tracks um, those four represent um, drum tracks um, these are um, momentarily uh, resample like freeze stuff they are not um, labeled yet because they're fresh since last week there are other buttons which shift the functionality or add functionality to those tra different tracks um, the most obvious one is probably the play button. Now, if I hold down the play button, it goes into the play mode. Um, there's a functionality in CliffX Pro, which is called X mode, um, which can shift the functionality for um, a trigger. Like each of these button is uh, defined as a trigger to trigger an action, which is then um, done in Ableton. Now, if I hold down the play button and I press one, it starts whatever is in slot one on track one. Um, I prepared a loop. And then um, I have other, other tracks. Um, with mute, I can mute stuff momentarily by just going, um, pressing down. And if I let go, they start playing again. Um, this is especially um, useful when um, when you have a beat and you want to have a um, uh, variations. Okay, um, and this is done um, also by a functionality in. CliffX Pro, which is called G Control. So you can define different actions uh, applied to uh, different events. You have an event if you press down and you have an event when you release the button. This is how I, um, I do this mute button. If uh, I press down, it gets muted. If I let go, it unmutes. Okay. Now I have um, a variation um, of of uh, of this loop in in um, in track one uh, in slot two. Now to start that, I um, select slot two and then press play, and there's the variation. Another great feature in CliffX Pro are bindings. To give you an example, I start a loop, um, this one in, in track two. Those eight buttons represent the eight uh, loop tracks. So to bind, to go to loop track two, I press the second button. Now it's connected to the second one. And now I want to um, send it, for example, to the delay. I simply uh, turn up the knob and I can do stuff with the delay or uh, with the, 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 the reverb, which was not turned on. And so on. I mean, you can do pretty much everything to point out one aspect, and that is variables. What I can do with this, I have a command to record uh, a loop, record on track one, four bars in slot X. And then what I do is I just define the variable, how many bars by pressing this button. And this button literally just says recording length is four. 
This one says slot is in three. And now I can say I want um, the first loop record in track six. And then I can trigger on my foot controller the recording process. And then it starts in uh, slot four, four bars of recording. Another great thing about G controls, you can control not only an event for press and release, you can also define um, when you hold down. So you have a um, command if you press something for a longer time and when you release it after a longer time or if you release it immediately. So when I press and hold down, it switches to the alternative um, variable, which is five. So this is slot five. And to reflect that, um, it uh, blinks, it flickers. I can have a representation of the parameters uh, sent by my setup via Wi-Fi to my iPad or to any other uh, destination. What is the matrix? It is indeed a philosophy how many pedals to use and in which order to put them. After my first experiments with Binklooper and the gear I had, I knew that with CliffX Pro I could build a powerful machine. I went all in. I cancelled retirement savings and bought a bunch of pedals. What's the point of getting old without pedals to play with anyway? I had the idea of a rig where I could effortlessly could change the order of effects, do parallel processing or even do feedback loops. To be perfect, it would be possible to control this programmed or automated. I knew that there were no hardware solutions for such a task in existence, at least at that time. There are some hardware solutions out there which do matrix mixing. For example, a company from Norway, Pladask Elektrisk, has a very interesting device called Matrice, a 4x4 analog matrix mixer. With this unit, you could connect three pedals and send anything anywhere you want. This is just a 4x4 matrix. One input and output is needed for the in and out, so you could connect only three pedals and only in mono. And there is no possibility to control anything via MIDI. After it became clear to me that there is no easy hardware solution, I thought about possible software-based solution. There is Ableton and I already used it for my scripted looping. Inside Ableton, I had individual inputs and outputs for each pedal. With the software monitoring activated, I now could send any signal to any pedal. But it was confusing, hard to control and to stay top of things. And then there were other problems too. Latency and CPU overload. This solution over Ableton had one major problem. If I go through the audio engine of Ableton, there will be a noticeable latency, about 14 milliseconds minimum. And this adds up each time I go from one pedal to the other. Going only through two pedals adds up to 84 milliseconds. Latencies greater than 15 milliseconds are noticeable for listeners, especially when you are also the player. But the latency was not even the real problem here, which each audio input monitoring activated, I put a serious amount of work to the CPU, which resulted in permanent CPU overloads and audio dropouts. Of course, the problem of latency is not new to the world of audio recording and processing. There's a technology called direct monitoring, which is a shortcut on the signal path before any DAW processing in the computer directly inside the interface. On some audio interfaces, it is done by an analog signal path fed directly in back into the monitor. No latency, no CPU strain. I finally took a closer look at RME interfaces, which have a stellar reputation in regards to reliability and quality. It comes with a mixer software called Total Mix, which is packed with features. It claimed that it could be controlled remotely via MIDI. I was intrigued and after some more research I bought an RME Fireface 802 and another DAAD converter additional to the one I already had. I now had 30 analog inputs and outputs plus zero latency mixing software fully controllable via MIDI. Two questions came up. How do I implement the operation on a piece of hardware and how do I manage to implement the control? Hardware controller. I had Innovation Launchpad Mini MK1 available. It is a hardware controller with an 8x8 pad surface. 
My first version of my matrix was straightforward. Each row represents an output and each column represents an input. For example, to send input 4, the 856 seller says, to destination 6, the hologram, I would press button 20. The LED of the button would light up and to clear this route I would simply press it again. The upside of this solution was that I have a direct visualization of what is going where. But it turned out to be much more complicated to realize. With an 8x8 matrix I am limited to 7 effect change, 1 is for representation as an input, but I was planning with 11 effect chains. The output would have been elegantly represented by the middle buttons, where source and destinations meet. It was also not possible to get the launch pad in a simple node toggle behavior, nor could I get the visual feedback to work. I got in Mark III later where that was no problem, but at that time I already advanced to another concept. For 12x12 matrix I would need a bigger hardware controller with 12x12 buttons. I did some research and found possible controllers, but there were boutique and custom made, therefore very expensive, so I abandoned this path. After some rethinking, I came up with a possible solution. I used one button for each source and one button representing each possible destination. For 11 effects and one input and output, this would be 24 buttons in total and this fits perfect into three rows on a launch pad. To assign a route, I press and hold down the desired destination and then press a source to turn on the connection. Although I have future plans to add features, this concept turned out to be very effective, intuitive and relatively easy to implement thanks to the architecture of RME TotalMix. The realization of my idea of a flexible mixer matrix was very intense, but I am confident that it works rock solid and can be developed even further. The possibility to combine external effects and control the signal flow from Ableton pre-scripted are endless. Thanks to the stability of RME TotalMix, my setup is reliable and responsive. It feels like an instrument. Every time I start making music with it, I feel satisfied because it is just a millisecond from the moment of, huh, how would this sound if I send this there and then back to this pedal to its realization? It was worth all the effort and I do not regret having chosen the red pill. Part 2. Making music sound manipulation and sounds of the double bass. Pedalosophy. Why so many pedals? When I play the bass, I'm often focused on intonation, timing or using the right technique. This comes from my classical training where the focus lies on the mistakes, with the goal to improve of course. But this is the conditioning which keeps me sometimes away from getting into a creative and playful flow. When I use pedals and move my focus towards them, I'm a child again playing with his favorite toys and forget about the world. This is the mindset which is great for creativity. I like to think about effect pedals as an extension of my instrument and toolkit for musical expressions. It does not replace any of traditional ways of expression. Pedals inspire me. The feel of twisting knobs is something which triggers that play instinct. It is a direct link of cause and result. It is an omnidirectional process. Playing the instrument, pedal modulating the sound and creativity, influencing each other in a triangle. I want to give you some examples what I can do with these lovely effects. First, pitch shifting. I have um, a loop here, which are upper harmonics and um, nothing special really. But I use this to generate chords with the H9 from Eventide. There are some artifacts in the upper register and I use a, um, a filter from, uh, from a modular system to filter those out. And then maybe some reverb. Um, doesn't sound wonderful. As a second example, I've uh, prepared a loop and I will send it into this uh, lovely unit from Chase Bliss Audio. It's called Moob, Mood and it's a granular micro looper and um, does cool stuff. Some kind of reverse delay effect and um, it's bound to a clock so you can 
pitch shifted. Morning Jams. I started a series called Morning Jams. The idea was to jam every morning with my rig and record this with the multicam video and audio setup. Although everything was ready built, it took 15 to 20 minutes of turning everything on, checking if everything works, etc. Unfortunately, I underestimated the time it takes to handle the massive amount of data and editing the material afterwards. 20 minutes of making music resulted in 150 gigabytes of video data and the copying process alone took 50 minutes. To get two minutes of edited material, it was a half day of work. I quit doing this on a regular basis and I switched to do my jams as audio only. I had a coaching session with Markus Bürgler and he showed me a great way to use delay and reverb. He uses a volume pedal after a split signal to control the volume what goes into the delay and reverb. And with the long decay and feedback I could freeze sounds and you hear the result in the morning jam I did after this session. Doing morning jams was great. But I knew I had to take a turn and work in more structured form sooner or later. The whole point of building this complex setup as accessible as possible was to be able to script a looping performance. But it turned out to be much more challenging than expected. The setup had become too complex and I ran into various stats ends and conflicts. The first song I did a script for was Escargot de Lispas, where I first did an arrangement and then translated this into sequencing scenes to control the recording process collaboration and improvisational context. I think of my rig more as an instrument than a pure effect unit. My approach for building this rig was the possibility to play with it and with other musicians. Together with Julia Warren, a fantastic musician and improviser, we booked a day in the studio of the Conservatory Maastricht. The plan was to have Julia playing into the rig, me looping her and reacting towards both ways. Of course, I also played some bass. But in this setting, I could concentrate on being a knob twister or sound manipulator. This was also a test how well the setup is built to take on the road. A whole show of a guy playing double bass is quite likely a little bit boring, at least visually. Right from the beginning, I had the idea to control visual elements with my setup. The whole programming of the setup itself took so much time, I realized that in an early stage, I won't be able to do this on my own alone. Luckily, I met Tom Luiten, a visual artist and teacher at the Zwick University of Applied Science. I told him about my ideas and he agreed to work with me for my graduation concert. And I am beyond happy that he will be part of the show. Concept I imagine visuals which are generated from my audio signals. I have them separated in my computer. Tom works in the field of computer-generated art, but to generate art you need data. I thought of ways how I could provide him data of my setup he could work with. Possible sources of data from audio tracks. No pitches, velocity and frequency spectrum. I found plugins which are free and analyze audio data to transform them in OSC. This data can then be sent over Wi-Fi to Tom and he will feed this data into his system to generate visuals. We had a recent test to see if it works and it did work right away. A short update. The live visuals won't happen. Very unfortunately, Tom is confronted with a private situation which he has to take care of and he can't be with me at my concert. Conclusion. It feels much more like a milestone than a finished work where I am now. I did not imagine I would start to program in a proper language like Python. I can recall a conversation I had with Laurent Peckles at the beginning of our studies in Maastricht when we talked about my project. He said, it could be very useful if you do some programming in Python. And I replied, I will never, never, ever start to program in Python for my setup. Because if I do so, I'll open Pandora's box and I won't have enough time to use my setup and make great music with it. Well, I did open Pandora's box wide open and I spent uncountable hours to get my ideas formed into working code. Before I started to make music, I programmed software at the age of 11 and I remember it as a rewarding and deeply satisfying process. Back then, I spent a whole week in front of a monitor and if my mother had not provided regular meals, I would probably would have starved a great deal.
If I encounter a technical problem, the curiosity to find a solution is very powerful in me. It has been a driving force for me ever since. And this has led to many great solutions and my setup is working in a way I would ne have never imagined. The possibilities and stability at the same time is most satisfying. That being said, I have not spent enough time to make music with it in relation to how much time I spent developing it. it would, I would estimate one part making music to seven parts programming. That is why it feels much more like the beginning of a project rather than a point to write a conclusion. The good thing is, the real fun part lies ahead of me. When playing and experimenting with my setup, it is easy to get lost for hours just jamming and making soundscapes. At some point, I had to force myself to forget about all the future plans to improve and reprogram and work just with what I got. That worked great when I did so. Choices and Limits I learned about the beauty and effectiveness of setting limits. In many conversations I had with Matthias, Scott Harper or Markus Böckle, it was a recurring motive that I should limit down my possibilities to give my creativity an appropriate room to unfold. It lies in my character to look first at all the possibilities and collect them. It is an acquired competence to set limits. That does not happen naturally or instinctively in my case. In regards to my development as an artist, this technique is the most helpful and effective I learned about in the last two years. It helps to focus on the music. I think I read somewhere that our brain is not capable to process more than three parameters simultaneously, and it definitely works best when focusing on only one thing. Side effects and future plans. The world of pedals is a small one when you put the few big brands aside. There are vast numbers of small companies that build acquaintance paddles. I was able to make connections with some companies and the people behind them. It feels like a family community. I became a better tester for the three degrees audio. Or I did an interview with Scott Harper, the brain behind the YouTube channel Knobs and the co-author of the book Paddle Crush. I also became an alpha tester for the new version of CliffX Pro, which works with Ableton Live 11. Reflection I am very satisfied of how far I've come and I am thrilled to see where it will go. I had few occasions to test my setup in a setting where I improvise freely with it. Due to the open concept and flexibility of Ableton Live and CliffX Pro, it is easy and fast to integrate and realize new ideas. Ableton Live is designed to connect to other software, so the idea to integrate my setup into an existing band which also has Ableton Live is relatively seamless. Just recently, I got selected for an artist residency at the Rock Hall in Luxembourg for a project of the sonification of data with Dr. Valerie Vermeulen with a big concert on the 3rd of December. Thank you very much for your attention and have a great day. Okay, what is happening? And this is uh, the sign that um, the bread in the oven is ready. So I'll see you in a bit.
welcome back in the live room. We're here to uh, follow, follow, uh, follow up with the Q&A of um, uh, Sebastian Schlappe Flach's uh, master research presentation. You've just watched the video presentation. Um, and of course, uh, we encourage you to put your questions down in the chat box. Uh, we can read them out here to, uh, to ask them to our candidate. Schlappe, please. So, well, your coach is uh, Matthias, yes. who uh, unfortunately was not here today, um, but we have a great replacement of him <laughs> in the name of Tim Haas here, so I would like to invite him to ask the first question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very hard to choose, uh, but let me try to get to the core of it. Okay. So I think you're uh, super self aware and self-critical already, how you presented yourself in your great presentation, by the way. Um, yeah, you, you developed this, this matrix, which, which is very powerful, and um, this, this big machine, and um, <laughs> your, your goal seems to be, or you also made it clear that it's to have a maximum liberty, because that's just part of your, your personality. Um, and I wondered what is what is the goal actually when you you're making music. You, you already s named some goals like um, you want to be playful like a child that that helps you. Um, you want to have improvisational freedom. But f yeah, two central questions to me are what makes a good double bass performance in your opinion, and how should your improvisation sound in the end? Because you have all this freedom and you're trying to set boundaries, but um, yeah, how do you want to have your improvisation sounding in the end? It could be anything. Um, okay, there are a few questions actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. So probably um, the hardest first, like um, the goal of what music makes us like in general, uh, why are we making music? So this is like not kind of bound to this project but um, because it's fun basically and um, it's a great thing to do um, and improvisation how uh, I imagine them to sound like it's um, it's a field between um, informed by of the direction where it could go by a certain sound I discover in a, in a pedal uh, which just like a not lucky accident which happens and I go, oh I like this and I go with it or sometimes it's um, I um, have something in mind and I try to achieve it with with the tools I have um, and sometimes it's like um, Bing Beats does um, to recreate something um, in like on the double bass I'm going to perform a, one of my most favorite drum and bass tracks from Square Push at the, at the concert. And um, yeah, let's we'll see how that goes. Um, any strong other? double bass performance. Strong double bass performance. <laughs> well, um, I mean, beside the, the standards, I would say um, standard like intonation and sound. Um, like the sound aspect is really probably the most difficult one um, but being alone on stage makes it much easier because uh, when you're not alone you have drums or something like saxophone is the worst which is um, because it's omni omnidirectional and um, all you hear on the double bass mic is then saxophone or drums so being alone um, that's an advantage in terms of a, a double bass performance um, I mean, timing is the most important thing for me, um, and also having a variety of sounds, not only with pedals and effects, also with um, with the natural sounds of the double bass. I mean, there's a huge free jazz scene. Um, I had lessons with uh, Robert Landfermann, who showed me some techniques which are quite they're not sounding nice, but they sound very different. And in in combination with pedals or like with loops, it can be quite um, disturbing and um, make a nice 
a comfortable tune afterwards even more nice. So probably the answer is a strong double bass performance um, should be based on dynamics and variety. Yeah. I will go next then. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. So you, you have a, you have a, a quite challenging uh, thing that you've been researching because you have an instrument with actually a rather complicated range for, for looping endlessly. Uh, let's put it simple, right? It's a low range instrument where you, you can, as you just explained, pull out very different kinds of sounds. But I was especially wondering, uh, because you create a lot of loops that you would then like to play over top of, etc. Uh, you would like to in the end show also your free improvisation, I think also just the scope of the instrument more in its natural way. And in doing so, I was wondering what, um, what uh, discoveries you might have made um, with the loops that you would put at the foundation of such such uh, things. So uh, have you discovered things you have to be careful with, yes. etc.? Yes. I think as a rule of thumb, um, it should be, uh, the roles should be distributed like in a band, like one bass function, um, and then a kind of chord function, and a melody function, and a rhythmic function. And um, if it's in the same range, um, I often went with doublings to have some, some texture um, to keep it alive. Um, but um, yeah, it, that's, that's a challenging part. So basically, or as a rule of thumb, not more than four, five loops stacked on top of each other. Um, yeah. And did I miss any? Oh, that's no, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. Um, yeah, talking about the improvisation, um, it's uh, it ended up mostly as ambient. I think right. that's like just a natural thing which is going to happen. Um, and I, those four buttons which are weren't labeled, which weren't labeled, um, I. I had the idea to implement the Brian Eno method, let's call it the method, uh, in my setup to like being re uh, able to record um, what I hear or what comes out of my setup, um, resample it, and um, I program them momentarily so I can have different loop lengths um, in this regard, what the tempo is going on in Ableton. So I can have three layers um, always moving because of the different loop lengths. And um, yeah, as this happened just recently, I haven't spent that much time like working something out. Besides, uh, don't clutter up, don't play too much. Mm. So interesting little follow up on the ambient resulting yeah. output. Uh, is how, how do you feel about that? Is that satisfying your, your objective or do you feel that there's something you could, you could try to uh, also uh, broaden this somehow? Um, no, I think that's pretty much fine with it. I just have to be careful that um, usually it's easy to get lost um, in like an ambient track and when I play I'm not getting bored, I'm playing and enjoying it and then I look at how the length of uh, what I did record in this like 25 minutes I was like, whoa! <laughs> this is not going to play it on the radio. Um, so, yeah, I try to have like uh, a space for an ambient track, um, but on the other hand, like a scripted loop performance where it goes bam, 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 and have it quite uh, structured and stuff happening fast. Because it's kind of boring when you play something and you need like eight times to put in a loop and then you have four loops, like two minutes watching a guy uh, stacking layers. Yeah. Yeah, I just would like to say <laughs> really enjoy your presentation and your work and uh, I admire your really calm voice speaking about all this. <laughs> it's really great <laughs> hearing your very calm voice like really speaking about very complicated stuff. 
was very complicated stuff and yeah. um, maybe I have like a question probably I don't know maybe yeah. it will be a very short question no, sure, sure. really short answer but let's see you mentioned that you also were busy with uh, like a looping machines in back in 2000s yeah. or some of this I guess it was 2003 for the implementation actually I One. no it was in the 90s I did looping stuff did that. Okay. Yeah. so you're speaking about like 20 25 years yes Maybe very trivial question, uh, <laughs> but uh, obviously it's a, a huge, enormous, uh, you know, like uh, yeah. development of uh, technology. Um, yeah. So how about about the, how about this development? Like, could you maybe say like what were the downsides of the of what I did back, and what are the downsides actually nowadays? Because there are certainly also downsides of of, of this technology. For sure, a lot of possibilities. Could you compare this a little bit? I know it's huge. I mean, Change. I mentioned. I think I mentioned it in the in the presentation or in the conclusion. The danger uh, is when you have so much technology involved. Um, technology can always fail, and um, it has a strong power to uh, grab your attention and your focus. So it's easy to spend weeks um, trying to implement uh, some feature and programming in Python and, and stuff, or um, checking out one loop pedal or like one delay pedal and then spending hours on the internet to find a better delay pedal or whatever. So there, there lies a danger, but um, uh, it takes some discipline and maybe just awareness of that. And um, I allowed myself to be in that space for some time, but only under the condition that I um, uh, pushed a stop button at some point and say to myself, I just use the delay pedal I have now and don't waste my energy on, on uh, finding another one. Um, and there are some artists I really uh, deeply admire who um, doing great music with literally shit piece of equipment and I take this as a kind of a role model um, that the equipment does not define the quality of the music it's the artistic um, attitude or um, what's it called uh, the artistic intention which can ma which makes a difference probably and with the looping technology, to cover that a little bit, um, as I said, I had this, this machine in 2003, and uh, it broke. Uh, two years later, I spared that story out because it was a little bit long. And two years later, I found a second, second one, second hand, got it, and there was like a really noise on, on the, the power supply unit. I found a, um, a shop in Oregon. <coughs> USA sent it there. He modified it uh, and improved stuff. I got it back. Had to pay like 150 uh, customs and another 100 for for shipping. Um, I took it out. I was excited. I put it in. It was. Poof. It was broken again. And that was the point. I'm done. I'm done. And <laughs> and this was like in 2000 seven or something so and true. and like from 2007 till two years uh, before I kind of did not use loopers yeah so you needed some break <laughs> I need some break yeah I took some time off <laughs> from the looping world <laughs> great, thanks. great yeah. thanks yeah any questions in the room okay then one Philip yeah where do, do you plan to uh, is it in an event environment or with other musicians or is it really uh, yes yeah. yes I mean uh, it's quite big it's quite heavy it's quite expensive and stuff but um, I, I really enjoyed the session I had with Julia and I'm really looking forward to this residency and um, it's an interesting scene um, I got in touch with really great people like Beardy Man and, uh, and uh, Jamie Liddell um, and there's also like this academic world of data and science and artif artif artificial intelligence 
uh, informing artists and artists informing uh, artificial intelligence, like there's some interaction between machines and humans. That's, I think it's really interesting, uh, interesting subject. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's kind of hard to integrate this in a band because it's big. I mean, you take literally on some stages, you take the half of the stage just with like cables. Um, but uh, if there's, um, I think there'll be, there will be some opportunities sooner or later. Yeah. As a bassist, yeah. artist, knob twister, looper, etc. <laughs> what is now your artistic goal having all this uh, new skill, uh, new setup? Um, where is this heading? Do you have a project that is clearly coming out as a no. soloist now? No, not really. I think I'll um, I'll see what comes because um, we live in un uncertain times anyway. And um, I mean, there might be some opportunities in like art exhibitions or like in this arty farty world um, where like half an hour um, ambient improvisation of a double bass player is something appropriate. <laughs> um, but um, on the other hand, you just have to uh, divide uh, the paycheck through one. So that's like an, an upside. Um, um, but I'm planning of uh, doing tutorials on this script software, uh, CliffX Pro, and there's like a vivid community around that software, um, and um, there's some exchange going on, and um, like with this nerd bubbles, there's always some, I mean, it's easy to get known quite fast. It is, uh, would you be interested in trying to find a let me call it the show level of like a Bink Beats performance. Yes. Would you think it's possible? Yeah. With your setup? Yeah. Because definitely. of course Bink Beats, the big difference is the diff lots of instruments basically. Yes. That will be the big difference. You are with a double bass and all the sounds you managed to create from it. What I did not show is um, I can, um, I have piezo triggers on the uh -huh. side of my double bass where I can trigger MIDI notes basically. So I can trigger whatever like mm. a melody or a drum sounds. I use it for drum sounds and also have the launch pad, which I can switch and can have like an MPC style drum beat. Um, mm. And what Beardy Man does, he uh, is a um, um, beatboxer mm. and he samples himself doing the drum sounds and then playing a drum beat with this. Mm. And I initially had the idea to let the audience do sounds or going around. Um, gathering sounds and do beats with that. There's a very interesting guy from um, New Zealand, uh, Lucky Paul, uh, and he has a super minimalistic um, setup and he goes, uh, walks around and into like pedestrian zones and have people come by jamming with him and uh, live streaming it at the same time. Um, so, yeah. You have many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not a problem. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for both your presentation and your ideas. My pleasure. So we will once more go into recess uh, and deliberation, and we will be back with the final presentation uh, of today at 3 o'clock with Philippe Royer's presentation. Five, five, five. Uh, o'clock, sorry. <laughs> Not, three o'clock will be soon. No, five o'clock. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello. This research aims to reflect on the use of West African rhythm elements in orchestral compositions to advance in my quest of finding my own artistic identity. As a first step to achieve a historical awareness and eventually learning about specific orchestration techniques, I analyzed the use of West African rhythm elements by other composers in an exploratory research style. As a second step, I analyzed these elements in my own compositions to show how I use these elements in my work. The third step consists of a market analysis in which I analyze the agendas of the orchestras in my region, namely Aachen, Liège and Maastricht, to get an idea which is the market share in their programming of this style of composition and in which direction I would go to seek for an eventual cooperation with an orchestra. The main result of this research is that there are quite few orchestral composers who use West African rhythm elements in their work, and that the composers who do so usually come from a mixed cultural background, which is also somehow true for me. In conclusion, this seems to indicate that the cultural background, background plays a major role in the inspiration process that leads composers to use West African rhythm elements in their work. To start, I'd like to say a few words about my motivation. As a musician in general, and as a composer in particular, one of the key questions to ask oneself is about the own artistic identity. I have been con concretely confronted with this question several years ago, when a good friend of mine asked me to write music for his ensemble, alto saxophone with string quartet. On my question, uh, what kind of piece or what style would you like me to write for you? He replied, I would like that you write a piece that reflects what you are. The only specification he added was that it had to be tonal and between four and eight minutes in length. This kind of situation was quite new to me. I spent my career mainly as a sideman and even in the personal projects where I was able to express myself as a composer, the artistic identity was more of a combination of the ones of the project members. So before starting to write notes, I took some time to reflect on what defines my own artistic identity and, on a more philosophical level, how I could contribute to create an added value for the evolution of music in general. I concluded that combining the different aspects of music that fascinate me would be the way to go. I would define the three main aspects as the following. First, the universality of certain formal choices like AAVA, whereas chorus, etc., mainly used in pop music, by opposition of the sonata form, for example, mainly used in classical music. Second, the emotional power and textural sophistication of the sound of the classical orchestra. Third, the I would like to call it bodiness of groove-based music in general, and West African music in particular. To understand this, you must know that, before coming to Maastricht and to study composition, I've worked many years as a sideman with several West African artists. Since then, I worked on my composition in this direction and I decided to take lessons to improve my skills, first in Brussels, then here in Maastricht. When last year the moment came to decide on a research topic, topic I thought that combining the orchestra and the groove aspect would be an interesting topic. Not only concerning the, the relationship to my quest for a known artistic identity, but also concerning my contribution to the music scene in general. I think that particularly the groove aspect has been, hasn't been treated as much as the other aspects as a research topic concerning orchestral music. Before I dive into the research itself, I'd like to start by defining West African rhythm elements. There are actually three main elements. First, cycles or loops. Second, syncopation and accents on weak beats. And third, polyrhythmicity, two versus three, and what I call ambiguous subdivisions, which means that a 12-8 can be felt three times four or four times three. In the quest of summarizing the topic of the research, I came up with the main question which in my opinion combines quite well my personal interest in the topic as well as the potential contribution to the music scene in general. 
How can West African rhythm elements contribute to finding a personal style and path as a European orchestral composer? Furthermore, I formulated three sub-questions that are intended to be a look in, at the past, the present and to the future. The third one being less artistic in a strict sense, but more practical, let's say. The first sub-question regarding the past. How have West African rhythm elements been used by other orchestral composers? The second one, concerning the present, how can I develop my own compositions by using West African rhythm elements? And the third, concerning the future, is there a place in the music market for orchestral compositions using West African rhythm elements? First sub-question, how have West African rhythm elements been used by other orchestral composers? As I haven't found any earlier studies to which I would have been able to refer, the method that I use to collect information is the exploratory design. My first idea was to search directly for the term African composers, for which I found several articles and websites. Surprisingly, when listening to the works of the composers, I found out that the main African element was not rhythm, but rather the use of the pentatonic scale. So I expanded my research by searching for composers that were related to West Africa in the cultural or geographical aspect. For instance, Latin America, the US, Spain and Maghreb. And that's how I found indeed some examples. After having analyzed the compositions by ear, I transcribed the parts that use West African rhythm elements and listed them in a chronological order. Second sub-question, how can I develop my compositions by using West African rhythm elements? For this part of the research, I use the case study design by analyzing my compositions concerning the use of West African rhythm elements. Furthermore, I reflected on the effectiveness of the use of these elements. And the third sub-question, is there a place in the music market for orchestral compositions using West African rhythm elements? To answer, to answer this question, I looked at what the orchestras in my region do in this area and what could be an artistic business plan for me. The method I used for this path, part is the benchmark study. Louis Moreau Gottschalk was born in New Orleans, where he was exposed to multiple musical influences, European, Creole and Afro-American. He studied composition in Paris and worked as a pianist and composer in the US and Latin America. The elements used in this piece at the beginning of the second movement are the cycle and syncopation. The lower strings play a repeating rhythmical motif, while the higher strings play the melody using syncopation. Gustav Holst is an English composer whose most famous work is the orchestra suite The Planets, from which, from which Mars, the bringer of war, is the opening piece. It has been used in many movies and film composer John Williams has been inspired by its atmosphere and orchestration for his work in the Star Wars movies. The element used in his composition is the rhythmic oscillato or cycle played by the string section in the beginning, which dominates the whole piece. Florence Price is noted as the first African-American woman to be recognized as a symphonic composer. The opening movement has melodies and rhythms typically found in Afro-American folk music. The element uses syncopation in the melody played by the bassoon right at the beginning. Jose Pablo Moncayo was a Mexican composer. The piece Huapango is an orchestral arrangement of popular dances from the eastern state of Veracruz. Among the examples I found, this is the piece that uses the most of West African rhythm elements. 
The first, the rhythmic cycle. The motif which is played by the violins, violas and cellos in bar 51 and 52 is repeated first by the same instruments, then by the woodwinds in bar 55. <laughs> Second element is the syncopation, accents on weak beats. Last note of 51 of the violins, violas and cellos. And third element, ambiguous subdivisions. The trumpet plays in the bar 59, 3-4 against 6-8 in the harp and the strings. This piece is part of the musical West Side Story. Inspired by Shakespeare's play Romeo and Juliet, the story is set in the mid-1950s in the Upper West Side of Manhattan in New York City, which was at the time a multiracial blue-collar neighborhood. The piece is supposed to imitate a jazz atmosphere. It is written in 6-8 instead of 4-4, which would be the standard for jazz musicians. I suppose Bernstein chose this option because it was the best solution to make classical musicians play with a swing feel. On the other hand, the swing interpretation is alternated with eight note doublets, which would correspond to even eights in a jazz score. But on the recording, the difference is hardly notable. The element used is syncopation and accents on weak beats. The upbeats in bar one to seven and both notes in bar 8 in the violins. I've been surprised to have found as few examples of orchestral composers that have used West African rhythm elements, especially among African artists. Being aware of the limitations of the research work that I've done, that doesn't of course mean that there isn't any African composer that uses West African rhythm elements, but at least I can say that it would require a different research approach. Furthermore, I must admit that I haven't found any score or even piece from which I would have been able to take some information concerning the use of specific articulations in conjunction with specific rhythm elements. On the other hand, this seems to indicate that the idea of combining West African rhythm elements and orchestral arrangements is a concept that's worth working on and being developed, for me personally and as for composers in general. In this part, I will analyze the use of West African rhythm elements in my own compositions. As I mentioned before, I had the opportunity to get some experience in West African music by collaborating as a sideman with several artists from the region, Benin, Ivory Coast and Togo. I began to experiment with these elements in my compositions several years ago when a friend of mine asked me to write a piece for his ensemble. Most of you already know the piece from the master band. The name of the piece is a tribute to Pierre Van Dormael, a Belgian guitarist and composer for whom I have a lot of admiration for his ability to combine jazz, pop and African music. The piece is in 3-4 and built around an AABA form. As an introduction, the soloist plays a pentatonic riff which is cycled using a triplet subdivision of the pulse with accents on weak beats and syncopation. The riff is taken over by the cello and viola in a divided form in bar 3 and evolves into a more complex riff in bar 5. This new riff will be used as a rhythmic bass for the harmonic background throughout the piece. Here's an example during the first 8 bar bars of the theme.
The second piece I like to talk about is a piece that I named Paris Dakar. I wrote it initially for string quartet, and unlike Pierre under the mango tree, which starts directly with an African style riff, the concept of this one is to play with the differences between a European style rhythmic environment, Paris, and an African one, Dakar. In the intro, the second violin and the viola starts with a classic waltz rhythm. At bar four, the first violin joins with an ascending line in triplets. The second violin takes over the triplet idea in bar five, which creates a polyrhythmic feeling regarding the straight eight notes in the first violin. During the first main theme, which starts at bar 11, the rhythmic atmosphere returns to Paris. Before the first violin enters again with an ascending line in triplets in bar 26. During the B part, there's a polyrhythmic moment in bar 54, where when the first violin plays a quarter note quadruplet, while the other instruments stay in a classic 3 4 subdivision. In the following A part, which starts at bar 59, the rhythmical tension is once more amplified by introducing accent on weak beats for the first time. The second violin plays a two-bar clave-like motif at bar 59 to 60, which evolves within harmony during the following bars. In bar 67, the rhythmical tension is once more amplified by introducing syncopation also in the melody, first violin, before reaching its climax in a descending line played in unison in bar 73. The tension is relaxed in the following intro, including the pickup line in cello at bar 74. The bridge switches frankly to 9-8 and to a purely African rhythmic environment, the musical trip having finally arrived at Dakar. Using syncopation and accents on the weak beats, at bar 85 the cello starts with a two-bar clave-like ostinato joined by the viola two bars later. At bar 89, first and second violin start with melody, whose rhythmical concept is also rooted in West African rhythm elements, and which is complementary to the clave played by the cello and the viola. At bar 97, the roles are switched. First and second violin take over the clave rhythm and the viola and the cello play the melody. In bar 101 to 102, there's a rhythmical dialogue between the first and second violin, taking back the melody, and the viola and the cello, which are answering by short, rhythmically complementary interventions. The dialogue merges into a rhythmical unison in bar 104. From bar 105 on, the cello takes back the two-bar clave-like idea from the beginning of this section. The other instruments perform the harmonized melody, the viola joining the cello in its comping role in bar 108. to 112, the rhythmical dialogue from bar 103 to 104 is repeated. The Dakar section climaxes at bar 119 to 122, where the first violin launches in 5-8 note pattern and is joined, rhythmically shifted, one by one by the other instruments until they end together on the last 8 note of bar 122.
One aspect of my research was the idea to do a market analysis. This means that, for me as a composer who writes orchestral music in which the groove element plays an important role, I'd like to know if and to what extent this kind of music is played by the orchestras in my neighborhood. That would allow me to adapt my artistic business plan accordingly and, uh, for instance, see if a collaboration would make sense and in which direction I would aim for one in priority. With this in mind, I have analyzed the agendas of the concert halls in Aachen, Liege and Maastricht, which are the main venues where the local orchestras perform regularly. These orchestras are the Symphony Orchestra Aachen, Philharmonie Saar Nederland and L'Orchestre Philharmonique Royale de Liege. One important aspect that I like to notice is that the amount of information available is quite different from venue to venue. In the agenda of Aachen, there are nine concerts for which the program is specified in detail. For Maastricht, there are 22, for Liège, there are 37. So, given the fact that the data is so different for each location, I must admit that it's not usable for an objective, objective conclusion. Nevertheless, I would say that the number of pieces, including West African rhythm elements, is higher than I expected. I also, I also have the impression that the amount is higher than, for example, 10 years ago, and that the programming is slowly opening to other styles than only classical music. Concerning the third sub-question, is there a place in the music market for compositions using West African rhythm elements? I would say that yes, but for more precise analysis, further research would be necessary. As a first conclusion, I would say that the concept of combining West African rhythm elements and orchestral music is, from a historical point of view, a phenomenon that is quite rare. Interestingly, the most conclusive examples that I found, namely the pieces of Gottschalk, Price and Moncayo, are not from regions that are geographically related to West Africa, like Maghreb or Southern Europe, but from regions like the US and Latin America, which are related culturally by their diversity of population to both Europe for the orchestral tradition and West Africa for the rhythm elements. Another aspect that I like to notice is that the concept of, combine, of combination seems to have been bottom up. That means that the composers who have integrated West African rhythm elements into their work had done so, being inspired by popular music and not by a purely intellectual concept. In the case of Gottschalk, it has been the multicultural influences of his hometown New Orleans, which about 50 years later to his first symphony from 1859, was one of the places where jazz took off. For Florence Price, the inspiration came from melodies and rhythms typically found in Afro-American folk music and for Moncayo from popular dances from the eastern state of Veracruz in Mexico. For myself, I would say that, although I have never lived in the US or Latin America, the inspiration had also come from my multicultural environment, from the 20 years I lived in Brussels. As I mentioned in the introduction, I had worked many years as a sideman with several West African artists, and I had been a member of a Protestant church it was led by a pastor from the Democratic Republic of Congo, at which members were to 90% of African origin. So I think that West African rhythm elements can indeed contribute to finding a personal style and path as a European orchestral composer. But this research seems to indicate that the cultural environment plays a crucial role in the inspiration process. While reflecting on the broader meaning of the results of the research, especially the inspiration process, I remembered that I read an interesting remark concerning the combination of rhythm elements from popular music and orchestral music. The remark comes from the book The Clave Matrix from uh, David Penalosa. It talks about a composer who thinks he uses primitive or popular rhythms. Quote, In the early years of the 20th century, Igor Stravinsky, in The Read of Spring, shocked his audience with inject asymmetrical rhythms meant to convey primitive ritual. Purely a theoretical conceit, it couldn't have been further removed from the real thing. Primitive music, primitive, has always and everywhere been bound to the rhythms of nature, that is to say cycles, the rising and setting of the sun, the seasons, 
the tides of the sea, the tides of, the bre of breathing, the beat of the heart. The function of cyc cyclical rhythm in traditional music is to align the community, each to each, each to all, all to forces of nature. And so, while Stravinsky's dancers in Paris were desperately trying to stay in step with the choreographer in the wings frantically counting, dancers, singers and drummers on a small island in the Caribbean are playing, singing and stepping rumba, perfectly locked into the symmetrical four-beat cycle. End of quote. I know that not everybody agrees with this remark, but I find it quite interesting in the sense that it confirms my sentiment that if a concept is over-intellectualized, in this case the use of primitive rhythms, the artistic performance risks the lose of its strengths. I think this is a good reminder for every artist, including myself, to keep the balance between the initial inspiration and the intellectualized concept. This is, in my experience, especially true for rhythm concepts. On the other hand, as the number of pieces that I analyzed is rather small, the answer to the main question stays, of course, quite subjective. One of the surprises that I encountered during this research is the fact that I have only found a few examples of orchestral composers that have used West African rhythm elements, especially among African artists. As an attempt of explanation, I would say the following. From personal experience, I know that the African artists who practice music using West African rhythm elements are primarily coming from a folk and popular background, where music is played without scores. They sometimes use score sheets, but the use of written notes on a staff system is extremely rare. The learning and rehearsal process is based, like for other artistic activities in Africa, mainly on oral transmission. This is true, by the way, for some pop artists in the West, especially for those being part of the, let's call it subculture, music scene, punk, uh, techno and rap and so on. Furthermore, the relationship between them and classically trained musicians is often, let's say it's uh, diplomatically distant. Second, on the other hand, the process of composing for orchestra is unthinkable without the skill of note writing which most of the time is learned in a classical training environment. So for the African composers that I found, I suppose they too are classically trained and they, uh, that they belong to an artistic environment that is quite separate from the one who uses West African rhythm elements regularly. Concerning my compositions, although from a writing perspective, I was quite happy with the results, I had the impression that at the beginning of the composing process, my pieces lacked a certain energy. It was particularly true for the sextet version of Pierre under the mango tree and the quartet version of the bridge of uh, Paris-Dakar. During the writing process, I noticed a first improvement when I added percussion instruments. On one hand, they added more of the lower frequencies and on the other hand, they helped to feel the primary beat. The second improvement occurred by working on the production side of the pieces. By doubling the orchestra bass drum with an electronic one, an 808, it gave the piece through the added low end frequencies this physical energy that I had searched for and which made the piece sound more accomplished in my opinion. This has led me to rethink my initial purely acoustic sound approach to a mixed one, in which I use acoustic and electronic instruments combined. For a live performance, I would go for a setup in which all instruments pass by a PA system, not especially to make them louder, but to be able to balance them out with electronics. For me, who worked a lot in a pop and production environment, this would close the circle in the quest for my own artistic identity. In this sense, the combination of electronics and orchestral music would be an interesting topic for future research. Thanks for your attention.
Welcome back at Conservatorium Maastricht. We are here to uh, now do the Q&A of uh, Philippe Royal's uh, presentation. And of course, I would like to encourage you to uh, drop your questions in the chat. Please, Philippe, come up here. Hello. Yes, thank you. So, Greg, I think it's, it would be nice as <laughs> the research coach of Philip to, uh, yes. to kick off. I would have a question. Um, I will combine my question a little bit like your role as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you're also a piano teacher, right? Yeah. And the rhythmics. Okay. So um, I don't expect that a lot of your students will ask for West. For the West. Uh, ah, for the, for this, uh, this kind of rhythm, music. Uh, 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 yeah, I understood that, that you're mainly coaching them like in a pop way and you yes. did like a method to, to do that as, mm -hmm. as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. The question would be, how, do that, how would you approach as easy as possible those rhythm, those African, West African rhythm elements, if somebody would have like interest in this? So how would you teach them? Of course, these elements are uh, uh, quite uh, used, uh, quite uh, uh, in... Uh, Pop music, so that it's it's it, it's not as rare as in orchestral music, uh, and uh, the method that I use uh, to uh, be uh, to uh, put them as comfortable uh, as possible uh, um, is to uh, choose uh, songs that they know already by by ear, so that the oral transmission has already been done in in the in the first place, so that uh, they they don't uh, have to to read this on the score, so, so that. Uh, Approaches uh, by, by ear actually, yeah. but so I, oral transmission would be the actually yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, because uh, I I noticed uh, as I as I wrote uh, for example in my ATS uh, work that I started after uh, having been to uh, to the conservatoire in Brussels like like a uh, long time ago I started uh, to base my my lessons on uh, on on. Uh, um, Staff writing actually on scores, on scores, and even for simple like uh, bossa comping styles, to to uh, to uh, read uh, to to uh, say to, to the to the students read this 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 rhythm, and uh, I, I noticed that it, after a while that it's much more easier to them uh, to to play it by ear than to read it, even for relatively simple uh, um, rhythms with syncopation and because the. the Classical uh, um, music writing is is very uh, intuitive for the for the note heights. I think uh, if if the, if the points get up, the, the note is higher, and the, the points get down, it's lower. But for the for the rhythm, it's not as intuitive. So it's uh, much easier to to do this by ear. Yeah, and then let them raise raise so yeah, yeah, yeah. first orally, and then oh, it looks like this. Yeah, yeah, and uh, from afterwards the day. But I I um, also uh, in in the um, teaching environment I use. Uh, Rather than uh, writing it in in, in, the, in the notes, uh, I use this uh, this um, uh, box system. So it's like a like a grid system. Uh, I think it's uh, called uh, uh, TAPS uh, T T U B S. I think it's a, it's a time uniform uh, box system. Um, mm -hmm. I describe it also in, in the in the ATS uh, work, and uh, it's it's like you you put like in, in a Piano roll of, of a door. You put uh, like dots on, on the on the on the on the grid, and it's much more. Uh, you can see where the, where the uh, right hand plays and the left hand plays. It's it's easier to to uh, visually integrate than on on the on the on the score. Yeah, very different question for me. Uh, you mentioned that you were trying to find West African composers or even African mm -hmm. composers that uh, would have used. Uh, these written elements in their own orchestral mm -hmm. uh, writing, right? My question would be uh, concerning is like how how large was the scope of of uh, West African composers you could find that wrote orchestral music? How many have you been able to look at in the first place? Mm -hmm. This was the first question I would have, and um, what could you? Tell me from reviewing their music regarding the style that they uh, that they chose for their writing. Uh, for the first question, it's, uh, I uh, don't remember if I found really orchestral uh, okay. works. I found some uh, like uh, string quartet uh, works from uh, from uh, people from Nigeria, I think. 
but it, it, it was like uh, more uh, the, uh, like I told the uh, African element was um, pentatonic, and it was like more uh, um, uh, contemporary style uh, composing, but uh, I don't, uh, I couldn't have uh, tell the difference uh, between an orchestra, uh, European composer and, and them, perhaps uh, except the, uh, the pentatonic uh, element. But uh, yeah. otherwise, it, uh, there was, it was was not very many that you found no, in no, the first no, place. No, 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 no. That's why I said I would have really uh, difficult to find. Yeah, perhaps I I could have uh, ride to Paris, to London, to the uh, to the Some to the, 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 the conservatoire to uh, perhaps. But uh, but I, but I uh, reflected on this on, uh, in in the dis in the discussion. I think the two uh, uh, environments are quite separate, still separate. Uh, that, uh, they are. From the African point of view, the, the people that I know, also in Brussels, that are, they play, who play this music, uh, do it by ear, not by yeah. by score, and uh, they have always this uh, with the score. Oof. And the one you you found, the Nigerian composer yeah. you found, do you, do you remember anything no. about the background of this composer? Mm. Was just wondering about the yeah, he, particular he, example. Like he uh, was born in Nigeria and he studied in London or, or in Paris or in, uh, in, the, yeah. in the Western Hemisphere. Or, yeah, but. Uh, not from his background, though. But uh, I know people. I, I found a orchestra in Ghana, actually, in a like symphonic orchestra, a little uh, chamber orchestra. Um, they were playing uh, regularly, even for for like for venues there. But they played only like a uh, Johann Strauss style of stuff, and uh, only European style of music. And uh, and again, I think this, the, the people is separate. Are separate and uh, so. The would you be able to hypothesize why why this would be the case, like maybe still or why at all? <laughs> um, I, yeah. like, like I said, it's, I think the two environments are separate, and uh, I know that from experience uh, also with with uh, artists uh, from the rest uh, that are more in the subculture. That there's like this this um, love and hate uh, because they're, 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 I think the orchestral sound is uh, it's uh, uh, universally. Uh, uh, recognized as an emotional superpower, I uh, would say. Yeah. But uh, the, the, yeah. the the relationship uh, between these two uh, gr two groups of uh, musicians are quite uh, distant. Like I said, it's, yeah, yeah, uh, like yeah, this. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I know also uh, uh, some uh, classical music uh, musicians who who uh, love to uh, to go to uh, techno parties in their in their in their. Uh, uh, um, free time, but uh, this is really a, a separate part of a thing that, that they do as a profession. Uh, as they, they see it really, uh, it's not the same, it's, it's music, but it's not, it's really uh, very separate. Yeah, and, it, and I guess, is it, is it true that, the, because when you think about more mm -hmm. rhythmical uh, orchestral writing, mm -hmm. you, you already came with this yeah, Stravinsky yeah, always, discussion, yeah, yeah. and the people you probably start thinking about will be like Stravinsky, Bartok, yeah, Ligeti, yeah, yeah. maybe Penderecki, like people that are more on the modern side mm -hmm. of things, right? But is it true that they were not never really influenced with by the West African? Is that correct? Because that, that was one yeah. of my wonderings. Like, isn't yeah. it, isn't it maybe possible that some of that body of work in the a little bit more contemporary area mm -hmm. might still have some influences from the West African I think culture as for well. The, for the Russians, for example, they have their own, uh, or from, from Eastern Europe, they have yeah. their own rhythmic, rhythmic culture. Yeah. They, I don't know, I think they use also uh, some West African rhythm elements, but they're not from, from West Africa, but from their own uh, popular exactly. dance. Culture, I think that it's it's a note not so it only might be quite unrelated. Yeah, yeah. To I, I I put in the title I put I uh, concentrated on West Africa, West Africa because I yeah. uh, know this uh, quite well and uh, because the, the influence in pop music comes from there actually yeah uh, by, by the by the people who were who uh, yeah. were moved to to the Americas uh, so yeah. yeah you have a question. Yeah, well, um, I'd like to try to wrap up a couple of them. I hope it's not <laughs> overwhelming you too much. Um, yeah, it might be uh, more difficult, or, or there might be reasons that it's more difficult to implement uh, those West African rhythm elements in an orchestral setting as opposed to in a, in a band setting with a rhythm section, bass and drums. And I was wondering, um, why is that? And um, did you have specific... Uh, questions when you 
uh, were analyzing the pieces you were looking at mm -hmm. that you wanted to answer in order to well, have some answers for your own arrangements and pieces. And um, Perhaps can I answer this, yeah, this question? No? I, I uh, actually uh, did, I, I hoped to, uh, to find some, uh, some uh, examples uh, from which I could have uh, learned from, actually from some articulations, how they treat uh, woodwinds, how they treat the string uh, section uh, to, uh, to uh, copy, uh, to... Uh, Articulation. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, like, like uh, when, when the uh, uh, legato, staccato, I don't know, uh, how they, how they have, uh, but I didn't uh, find any, uh, unfortunately, and uh, the most, uh, the closest I found was the uh, Moncayo from uh, Mexico, this was the only one who like the only one who really sounded uh, um, uh, grounded in this uh, kind of concept. Mm. The, the other ones were like uh, very very uh, shy, uh, like yes. uh, a syncopation here, syncopation there. But it, it was not like you feel uh, <laughs> <laughs> you like to dance to it. No? But, but um, Moncayo is really uh, really six eight and uh, with a syncopation uh, and. Uh, and I put the and, and and I listened to uh, some uh, some versions and uh, the I think I took the recording from a version from the orchestra from Venezuela uh, by uh, directed by Dudamel and it, it's you, you hear that uh, it, it's uh, they are perhaps uh, technically uh, technically uh, not so, so strong that uh, orchestra from Berlin from from Vienna but for this kind of music uh, it sounds more uh, <laughs> grounded. Yeah, so, so the difficulty yeah. you would, would have to overcome there is uh, how do the wind players, the string players, have to articulate yeah. um, I, I had those the experience uh, with, uh, with, my, uh, with my first version of the piano and mango tree some years ago. It was played by, by a good orchestra in Belgium, and uh, they, were, uh, they were like uh, uh, sweating <laughs> the string players, but because they don't know, they, they, don't, they are not used to this, this kind of, of uh, concept. Huh? It's, it's not very complicated to, to play uh, technically, but uh, mm. if, if the accents are shifted, yeah, not, not the accent of the, on, the, on the strong beats, uh, whoosh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for, for us it's, it's quite normal, it's, it's, it's not a big deal, but uh, for them. Yeah, but maybe, maybe a small one still um, in, your, in your piece, uh, Pierre and the Mango Tree, it mm -hmm. seems like the um, West African rhythm elements shape the overall sound of yeah. the piece, really. Whereas in Paris to Dakar, uh, you use them more as a tool like uh, tension and release in yeah. harmony, right? Yes, yes. Uh, so that's a thing that you had to discover on your own, really. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I tried both uh, both mm. concepts, and I, and, it's, uh, and I wrote a piece, and I uh, put the title afterwards, and I th thought, uh, as it's, a, it's a, the, the, the the name Paris Dakar is uh, from the from the rally. Uh, it's, it's a no name, so it, it and it uh, fits very well to the to the composition, I think, uh, because it's a, like a journey from uh, Europe to uh, to Africa, and uh, so. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any questions from the room? They are tired. Very shy. <laughs> very tired. Oh no, well, it's well done. Thank you, Philippe, for defending your case here. We will be <laughs> assessing uh, okay. assessing your work. We'll do. We'll go. Um, in the conclusion this time, no more recesses. Okay. Although for you it's a recess, you'll have to <laughs> await our deliberation. So okay. for the people online uh, and here in the room, uh, of course, next week we'll have two more research presentations. So be back. Thank you. <laughs>